Welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Nick Wasiliev, Booktopia's social media specialist and the producer of the Booktopia podcast. And it's just me today in the world of podcast land coming to you from my home office as most of Booktopia is currently working from home due to the restrictions in Sydney. However, I am delighted to chat to you today because about a week or so ago, the 2021 shortlist for the Miles Franklin Literary Award was unveiled. So for those of you who are unaware, the Miles Franklin Literary Award is one of Australia's most prestigious literary literature prizes. Established through the will of my brilliant career author, Miles Franklin, the award is the prize is awarded each year to a novel which is of the highest literary merit and presents Australian life in any of its phases. It was first presented in 1957 and the award helps to support authors and try and foster uniquely Australian literature. So many, many great Australian authors have been the recipient of this prize, including Patrick White, Thomas Keneally, Ruth Park, Tim Winton, David Maloof, Evie Wilde, Sophie Laguna, the list goes on and on. And Tara June Winch was the winner last year for her incredible uh, best-selling story, The Yield, um, which was included in many best of year end lists and was a Booktopia favorite uh, upon its release. But this year, the long list for the 2021 Miles Franklin Award was announced on May 18th, uh, with 12 books being selected and recognised by the judging, pan judging panel. And then on June 16th, the shortlist was unveiled, which is what we'll be discussing today, with several uh, surprises, including the omission of the likes of, of Sophie Laguna, who is a previous winner, um, Laura Jean McKay uh, and Nadi Simpson, to name a few. Um, Joe Lewin, our head of merchandise, did provide several perspectives on the shortlist in our Weekend Booktopian podcast that we covered on June 18th, which I will link to in the description box. But today we will be discussing the six books that rose to the top and are part of the shortlist for 2021. Richard Neville, the State Library of New South Wales Mitchell Librarian and Chair of the Miles Franklin Judging Panel said, and I quote, in various ways, each of this year's shortlisted books investigate destructive loss of loved ones, freedom, self, and the environment. There is, of course, beauty and joy to be found, and decency and hope, largely through the embrace of community. But, as the shortlist reminds us, often community is no match for more powerful forces." Unquote. So the first book in this list of six is Amnesty by Abirind Adiga. Telling the story of Danny, who is an illegal immigrant in Sydney, having fled Sri Lanka. So for three years, he's been trying to create a new identity for himself. And then one morning he learns that a female client of his has been murdered. Should Danny come forward with knowledge that he has about the crime and risk getting deported or say nothing? Over the course of a single day, he must wrestle with his conscience and decide if a person without rights still has responsibilities. Book two um, in this shortlist is The Rain Heron by Robbie Arnott. Telling the story of Wren, who lives alone on a remote frontier of a country devastated by a coup. High on the forested slopes, she survives by hunting and trading and forgetting. But when a young soldier, uh, when a young soldier rather, comes to the mountains in search of a local myth, Wren is inexorably drawn into an impossible mission. This is a novel that is equal parts horror and wonder. The Labyrinth by Amanda Laurie is the third book to make this year's shortlist. This deeply meditative book follows Erica Marsden, who in a state of grief retreats to a quiet hamlet near the prison where her son, an artist, has been imprisoned for homicidal negligence. Living in a rundown shack, she obsesses over creating a labyrinth by the ocean. And to build it, Erica will need the help of strangers, which is it turns the story into a hypnotic tale of guilt and denial, as well as a meditation on how art can be both ruthlessly destructive and restorative. Book four in the shortlist was a book that many in the office paid particular attention to, which was Lucky's by Andrew Pippos. The book centers around the eponymous Lucky, a second generation Chicago-born clarinet playing Greek man who finds himself in wartime Australia in the 1940s. 
escaping service by impersonating the King of Swing, Benny Goodman. Lucky comes into money through personal tragedy and uses it to run a successful franchise of cafe diners spanning several decades. This book is an unforgettable, unforgettable epic that lives about lives being bound together by the pursuit of love, family, and new beginnings. Book five in this shortlist is The Inland Sea by Madeline Watts, which is her debut novel. It is a story about coming of age in a dying world and exploring our capacity for harming ourselves, each other, and the world around us. Facing the open wilderness of adulthood, our young narrator finds the world around her is coming undone. She works part-time as an emergency dispatch operator, tracking the fires and floods that rage across Australia during an increasingly unstable year. Drinking heavily, sleeping with strangers, she finds herself wandering Sydney streets late at night as she navigates a troubled affair with an ex-lover. Reckless and adrift, she begins to contemplate leaving. And that brings us to our final book in the shortlist. And it is a very special book for the Booktopia family. At the Edge of the Solid World by Daniel Davis Wood is the title of this final shortlisted book. And it is distributed by Brio Books, who are part of Booktopia Group Limited. So Booktopia Publishing runs under the Brio imprint, uh, the Brio imprint which makes this novel our first book to ever make it into the Miles Franklin shortlist. And I was delighted to be able to sit down with the author himself, Daniel Davis Wood, to discuss the book and what it was like to make the shortlist for such an incredible award. Transition and through the magic of editing, I am delighted to welcome the author of At the Edge of the Solid World, all the way from the UK, Daniel Davis Wood. Good morning, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So for all of our listeners who might not be familiar with your book, give us the spiel. Tell us a little bit about your book, At the Edge of the Solid World. Well, At the Edge of the Solid World begins um, with the relationship between a man and a woman who are expatriate Australians. They're living in Switzerland in the Alps. And... Um, they uh, so their husband and wife, and they have a child who dies after one day. Um, and this the, the the big story of the of the novel, I guess, is that this sort of sends their marriage into crisis, um, particularly as they uh, disagree on um, how to deal with the aftermath, whether the child should be buried or cremated, where the ashes should be scattered. And this disagreement takes them back to Australia which is much to the, the narrator, his, the husband, much to his, um, his uh, uh, disappointment, shall we say. He's not, he's not mm -hmm. particularly fond of that idea. And uh, so as he tries to navigate uh, his way out of this crisis, he, he feels himself slipping into intense solitude and grief. He doesn't really know what to do and he begins to look around for, you know, perhaps other people who've had a similar experience who can give him cues or serve as models of, of, of how to deal with this. And one of those is uh, a father in Australia who also loses his child in a very high profile crime. And so he sort of becomes, the narrator becomes sort of obsessively interested in this case and it branches out, the novel branches out from there into many other um, stories of people in similar situations uh, and takes in a, a very vast scope of, of, of loss and suffering and tries to measure the narrator's sense of loss against many other injustices, um, some historical, some contemporary, of, of different scales. Wow. It's, it sounds very... It, it kind of starts small and just expands, this book. It's, uh, it's really incredible. Yes. Yeah. That was the idea. Yeah, it's uh, the narrator story is sort of like the base note for something, and then it and then it grows from there into a sort of I guess a, a harmony um, in a way where you have all these different voices coming in and, and sort of sounding the same mm. um, tune, I guess. It's funny you mention kind of how it, it this is such an examination of, of loss and everything because you, I, you talked about during the launch of the book, uh, the Zoom launch back when 
where this book that this book was written during a really depressing time um you know you, you mentioned how it was it, you were in that writing stage during the presidential election of 2016 and then you're in the uk when brexit was happening was this and i'm curious to know about where you were in terms of the mindset of this of this book um especially when compare, compared with your debut um blood and bone how and i'm assuming that that would have colored the writing process how did it how did that actual writing process compare um, with your first book? And did, was it really easy to fall into that examination of, of loss that you talk about and discuss in this book? <laughs> Compared to Blood and Bone? No, uh, <laughs> not at all. Blood and Bone was something that I wrote. Uh, Blood and Bone is a very, it's a short book. It's much shorter than this one. Um, and it, and the the right and it, it, it's more compact as well. So it's it's really just one one story, maybe two stories that are that are very tightly um, bound together. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, the writing process for that was was intense. It was it was short bursts, very concentrated. And yeah, the book was sort of written, you know, through a process that that kind of feels like what it, what it's like to read it, I guess, which is which is short and sharp and and so on. This book, uh, so in other words, I wrote I wrote Blood and Bone in in I think it was about six months it took me to wow. get it to a polished yeah. draft. Um, this one took six years, uh, <laughs> so you can tell already it's quite different. I suppose there are um, there are a few different aspects to the to the to the context of it. Um, there's the personal aspect, which doesn't really fall into the, you know, the Trump Brexit period. It was, you know, what was what was happening in my life, which was a, a very intense and difficult time for for personal reasons. And I think some of those are explored in the book, some not. But I think, uh, you know, the, the tone and and the uh, um, yeah, sometimes the narrator's state of mind and state of body, his his attention to what he's experiencing physically, uh, was drawn from from life in a way. As for the the broader context, I guess there are a couple of things to say. The Trump and Brexit things fed into it in different ways. So I mean, it's it's one thing to say that you know the Trump era was not a good was not a good time, but um, you know specifically how was it not how was it how was it an awful period and how did that feed into the novel is is more like um, you know so many different people and and groups of people were targeted and for, for persecution, really, mm. uh, of different degrees and in different ways, but in that period and, you know, from the top by the Trump administration, but also by supporters. And as someone who was outside that context, what it looked like to me was every one of those targeted people and targeted groups was um, trying to to draw attention to their plight quite justifiably, but also in a way that that where the appeal was kind of like look at what is happening to us this is this is terrible it's worse than what's happening to many other people who have it good comparatively and um that was that's something that the book really does explore it's like what is what is the value what is the moral weight of one form of suffering over against another form of suffering mm. is there even a way that you can measure that like I, I, I don't know if there is and so it goes from yeah the very personal domestic form through to, I mean, it, it gets up into the Holocaust and into slavery at one point in, in the book. So it's, it's really all these different forms of like, how do you, how do you figure out what actually is worse of two, two or three or four great evils that are happening now and that have happened before and, and so on. Um, Brexit was a different case, but, you know, I, I, um, my editor, Alice Grundy, I saw, she said the other day that she, she made a comparison well not, not a comparison, but she said, you know, we value, in Australian literature, the literature of migrants to Australia. And um, and she was talking about my book and she said, we, we also need to value people who have migrated from Australia. And I, you know, I, I could well imagine people who say, who would say that, you know, that comparison is not quite just, or that's not, there's something uneasy about it because migrants in Australia have quite a difficult time. But I actually do think that we are coming at, um, one big question from two different angles, migrants and expatriates. And, and Brexit for me highlighted that question. And it's really the question of um, how, how broad or narrow, how capacious is the concept of a nation 
as a as a form of organizing identity. Um, for migrant writers, like if you look at clearly Aravinda Diga's book um, on the shortlist, um, but also Amanda Laurie's, um, there are, there are questions of like. Is, or there's the idea that the Australian nation is too narrow a construct, you know, on the part of Australian citizens to accommodate people who have come into uh, the country. Um, that's, that's kind of the migrant to Australia view and the expatriate view is to say well, very much, yes, so the nation as a construct is too narrow for everybody. Um, it's too narrow a construct for for political affairs. You know, I think in in different ways we're all sort of open borders people. Um, certainly, I am, and 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 so I'm exploring it from a, a perspective where, um, well, from a narrator for whom it's important that borders, national borders, all national borders, collapse. Mm. Um, it, it's too limiting to human capacities to have those mm. you know, for him and for me too. It's yeah, it's and that, that's something that Brexit yeah. really threw up. <laughs> is what I, is what I'm getting at. Ultimately, like that's that's the terrible thing that it showed us. Look, I think a good indication of of, of a book or a, a, when it comes to writing is when you when you are creating a book is having something that is very much of its time, but also touches on something so much bigger um, that that I think, like you mentioned, talking about there's there has a, there is a real vibe to this to the the shortlist and also to your book, like you mentioned. Um, around, and I, I love that idea that you talk about of just the whole idea of borders being completely broken down. It, and particularly when you're examining this whole idea within your book of, of loss and resilience and fragility and expanding it out so much, I kind of want to ignore the, the whole cliche of if that was what you hoped readers would get out of the book, because obviously that's definitely being reflected in the great response and the acclaim that it's getting and the fact that it has made this short list. For you personally, I kind of really am curious. I, I kind of want to ask, because obviously this is a real, writing a book like this is a very, you're, you're really journeying into stuff, into yourself a lot, particularly for you, because you, like you talk mm -hmm. about with expats, this book touches on things that you um, have dealt with personally. Yeah. What did this book and the writing of this book teach you out of curiosity? Um, it taught me, uh, I suppose the big thing that the writing taught me is that um, all that stuff that you've just mentioned really isn't enough. Um, and I guess the narrator gets at this at the start of the book where he says, you know, I want, I wanted, he says about his child and about himself, I just wanted us everything. I wanted everything for us. I wanted us to feel every, every possible, um, every, every, yeah, every possibility of human experience. I wanted it all. And so as I was writing the book, writing the thing that, you know, the aspects of it that you mentioned, I felt, um, as your listeners who haven't read it might feel now that it was unremittingly dark mm. and terrible and um, and all those things and and so the writing of it really taught me that that's that's not enough like it it couldn't just be that and so so I was kind of deliberate and conscious about trying to offset a lot of that stuff not necessarily with levity like there's not a lot of jokes in the book but with moments of grace and beauty and moments of of true wonder or i hope what i hope comes across as true wonder and appreciation for um just uh, you know unanticipated gifts that come sort of in everyday forms so i think uh that you know there are sections there are passages in there about about the landscape of the alps about you know fireflies at night there there are passages about the falling of snowflakes. Um, I think the narrator at one point sees his, or at several points sees his daughter essentially as a ghost, uh, as a vision who, who comes back to him. And I, as, as heart-wrenching as it is for him, I, and I hope it is heart-wrenching, I also hope that it's something uh, wonderful for, for him and for the reader. And, 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 you know, I hope that sense of, of awe that he could possibly be, confronted by something supernatural and he's not sure about it i hope that really does come across so yeah that's that was the the process of writing it was as you as you say so intense and so 
so personal and and uh, I don't want to say distressing, but there it, it wasn't. It was very discomforting in a lot of ways because it's hard mm. to have the stamina yourself to write some of the things that are in the book. And so that to to yeah to balance it out with these other things was was probably the greatest lesson that I learned as I was writing it. And maybe that's why it took six years. <laughs> well, I mean, when you are dealing with with topics like this, it's it's something that you you can't just uh, you can't just cover it in no time at all it's something that is a is so big and so expansive have you been surprised by the response that the book has received have you has it has it completely caught you off guard (laughs) yeah completely absolutely i mean i published the book in 2020 which let's face it was not a great year (laughs) in the scheme of things um uh, for anybody i think but let alone to publish a book and uh originally it was uh Originally, it was scheduled for something like March or April 2020, uh, right? Like right as the pandemic was coming, I think. And then my editor, Alice at Brio, said, yeah, I think we need to postpone this. Can we move it to July? And at that point, it was still early enough where I was thinking, all right, well, that's kind of okay. And I was looking at going to Australia in July anyway to promote the book. Of course, that didn't happen. Like we cancelled that. And then by the, you know, it came out at the end of the year. And the reason it came out at that point was kind of like, you know, Alice said to me, we need to get it out there. Like people need to see it. It needs, it needs to happen. And I was just thinking like, wow, we're gonna, this is a book that took six years to write and it's like 500 pages. And I was hoping it would make a bit of a splash. And then it's going to be like dropping a stone into a bottomless well. And there's, it's not going to leave a ripple. It's just going to sink, you know, and nobody's going to see it because it's Christmas time almost. It's not a Christmas (laughs) book. I think we can safely say that. Uh, so I, I literally, yeah, it, it came out like late October, I think. And um, I literally thought nobody's going to read this. Nobody. They were, I even, I was even like, yeah, on Facebook or Twitter to just friends saying, if anyone wants to read it, I would be really appreciative. So I, I actually thought it would find no readership, no reviews, nothing like that. Zero. That was my honest view. <laughs> so I'm very gratified, as you can imagine, that yeah, it's and, had and, a and, second and, life. <laughs> And, and here you are, like yeah, nearly six yeah. months, it's over six months later. It's incredible. And I, I, by the way, I do forget myself at the start of this interview for not saying congratulations for making the shortlist for the Miles <laughs> <Thanks>. Franklin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how did it feel when you found out? Uh, it, yeah, it felt, uh, it felt really, can I just say strange? It, uh, <laughs> I, I, the way it's done is that I have, I have very little contact with the people. It's all through my editor, Alice. They communicate with her. She passes on messages. And um, so I found out via email just one morning when I woke up. And uh, it's a strange thing to find out via email and to know that the day is done by that point. So you can't really you know, get in contact with anyone. And also just you're also not allowed to say it. So I just I didn't really know how to sit with that uh, the news to be honest. Yeah. And then you just have to sit on it for a long time until it's announced. So um, it's, a, it's, it's just a strange period of being tight lipped and waiting, uh, waiting for the world to catch up a little bit to what you already know. Mm, it's yeah. I can imagine it would be a very strange, very strange experience. And additionally, like we were talking about before we started chatting here that you've also now after, after making the short list have, have had the chance to, to, to check out some of the other books that have also made it. Um, have there been any that have, have really stood out for you, um, checking out the competition? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, for me, there are two real standouts, um, and I would have a hard time deciding between the two. And those are The Inland Sea and The Labyrinth. Mm. Uh, I am, uh, for The Labyrinth, I, you know, I'm a long-time fan of Amanda Laurie. Uh, I mean long-time. Like, I you know, have been reading her for more than a decade, Um I don't think The Labyrinth is as good as her best book, which in my view is still The Philosopher's Doll, but I do think uh, it's way up there with that um, and Vertigo as well. Um, I like that it's a book that, uh, well, uh, the, you know, the Australian's literary critic Geordie Williamson wrote about it the other day. He wrote about the entire shortlist and he said something like it it has an apparent realism to it or it, it seems to be like a realistic novel. And I think 
whatever word he used to qualify it, I think really carries a lot of weight because it does read like a realist novel. But at the end of it, you're just thinking, why, what is the relationship between all these parts that are not ever quite connected in a really strong way, but they clearly have like thematic and emotional and psychological connections. There's just so much for the reader to have to just, just carry and, and work out. Um, to to figure out w w what this book is trying to do, which I really love. It's like, it's a bit of a puzzle, but in a very gentle way. Um, and uh, The Inland Sea, um, I think uh, I think Madeline Watts does that, uh, uh, does that amazing and difficult thing of um, kind of taking a narrator who is in a state of intense crisis, uh, as my book does, but is she's more explicit, I think, about how this has the effect of dissociation for her narrator. So her narrator, she says it twice somewhere near the beginning of the book, I was dissociated. You know, she's dealing with emergency calls. She goes into the toilet, the cubicle at work, she's crying and she says, I'm feeling dissociated. I have this dissociation problem. And um, I really love how Madeline Watts writes dissociation in the sense that the narrator is hyper vigilant, like she's looking everywhere all around her for meaning and trying to construct meaning. But because she's in this dissociative state, the reader is, is kind of always aware that the meaning she's constructing are not necessarily logical or legitimate or that she's, you know, the, the story she's telling is always very suspect by her own admission, because she's not in a great state of mind. But she seems to think that it is and that it's coherent. And so you're always kind of looking at how she connects the dots between different things in her life, but you're also thinking, yeah, but that's that's probably not the dots to be connecting right now. You know, it's, it's, it's like a double narrative in a way, which I think is very skillfully done. It's, I think, again, uh, like you were mentioning in earlier within the, within this podcast and in this discussion, just that new way of looking at, at the Australian Australian experience, which is what the Miles Franklin is all about, I think is what's impressive. And it's a good indication as well, the fact that your book's there too, um, discussing these subjects and looking at them in new ways, because a lot of them would have been probably well-tread before, but the way that all of these authors have done that is absolutely fascinating and fantastic to look at, which is really great. I'm glad to hear you say that. I think I think that's probably the big takeaway from the short list mm. as well is that there are there is you know kind of some old ground that that people are going over, but it is from really different perspectives. And I think from six well six very different perspectives that are different from each other. Like there are no two books on here that are that are quite similar in my view. Like yeah. it's it's a really varied and therefore exciting short list. I agree. I agree. Um, I could talk to you all day about this, but um, I know that we uh, have a very limited amount of time um, with our podcast, but I want to say um, thanks so much for, for taking the time to chat to us about it. And once again, congratulations to you and the, and the team at Brio for, for making it to the Miles Franklin shortlist. It's, it's, I think it's a wonderful achievement. And the fact that you've been able to do that with your second book is, is, fantastic um and congratulations and all the best for for what happens next thank you it's an honor and it has been a pleasure so for all of our listeners uh you can check out our thoughts of the miles franklin now on the blog um curated by olivia frico um, and additionally as well check out joe lewin our head of merchandisers thoughts on the Miles Franklin shortlist award or the Miles Franklin shortlist rather on our weekend booktopian podcast from June 18th, which I have mentioned will be linked in the description box for this podcast. So the Miles Franklin prize is managed by perpetual and presented in association with the copyright agency and the winner of the shortlist will receive $60,000 in prize money with each of the shortlisted authors who have been mentioned in this podcast receiving $5,000 in prize money. Keep an eye out for the announcement of the prize, which will be unveiled on July 15th of this year. That brings us to the end of this podcast. I'd like to thank Daniel for coming on and discussing his book, At the Edge of the Solid World. It was an absolute pleasure chatting to him. Um, and for all of our listeners, be sure to check out then uh, Daniel's book, as well as all the other books in the shortlist um, through the links in the description box down below. 
Thank you all so much for listening and never stop reading. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia. Australia's local bookstore at booktopia.com.au